Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. So Dr. Heather Sanderson, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. Yes, so so happy to have you on. I'm excited to have you on. Uh, reading about you, studying some of the stuff that you do, I was super excited to have you uh, on the show today because I've got lots of questions and I think it's going to be a very enlightening uh, conversation that we're going to have and hopefully opens up the minds of our viewers and our listeners and myself about the things that are out there. I mean, you're basically a, an expert in brain health. Can I can I can I say that that way? You're you're kind of like neuro biohacking, I think was part of your uh, bio, but you, you are, are, you're a brain expert. Can I say that? You can say that. I would never (laughs) say that, right? Because I have such a reverence for just the complexity of Uh, the brain that I don't know that anyone can really be an expert. Sure. Um, There's so much we don't know and we're certainly learning a lot. And yet what it comes back to over and over again is kind of like the common sense that just isn't common practice, those right. foundational things. Yes. And so am I a brain expert? I don't know. I sure talk a lot about the brain. <laughs> well, but, then let's tell, tell us about your background then, because you're, you're a naturopathic doctor, but really what's your background? Yeah. So I went to Bastyr University in Seattle. It's a naturopathic school. And I was, I've been interested in medicine my whole life and um, really planned to go through a conventional program and become an MD, Mm -hmm. but then got very disillusioned because it wasn't focused on health. And a lot of the people I was in classes with were, you know, they were taking no-dos and taking drugs to stay up all (laughs) all night so that they could study for exams. And I was like, this is not me. This is not who I want to be. Um, And so learning about the naturopathic curriculum and program, it's a much more complex system science approach where I think I think that that meets the complexity of the diseases, the, these complex chronic diseases that most people are really suffering with these days. And then the brain space really found me. Um, I didn't intend to treat those with dementia. Um, I didn't intend to go into biohacking or neurohacking. But the opportunities, I was very fortunate early in my career to be introduced to some big thinkers like Daniel Schmattenberger at Neurohacker Collective and, and some other people who were taking this complex system science approach and integral theory and applying that to health and medicine. And then through that, I was fortunate enough to get um, introduced to Dr. Bredesen, be trained by him, and start seeing patients who were excited about reversing their cognitive decline. And when I've you know, seen people actually do that after being told year after year by very bright, well-intentioned, super smart pr- professors, you know, instructors, people I was learning from, that you could not reverse dementia and to suggest otherwise would be to be doing someone a disservice, right? To be giving them false hope or their family false hope. And then to watch it happen right in front of me was it totally, completely life-changing, right? How do, you, how do you commit your life to anything other than changing the story around it when you see that something people have been told is impossible happen over and over again? So a lot of your work then is focused on dementia, Alzheimer's. I think also it mentioned ADHD, uh, other, other brain, dis- brain disorders. Um, but the reason I really wanted to have you on the podcast today is because that's so, it's, it's not just because for anybody listening, it's it, it's not just for your parents or your parents' parents, right? This stuff starts super early in life, uh, and it's preventable, if I can say that. Um, and so I really want to have you on the show because it's not just about, oh, dementia, and that's for old people. And this. No, 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 no. That's not it at all. This is stuff that's affecting us every day. Um, whether we know it or not, and it kind of comes on, it's kind of like the frog that you put in the pot and you, you know, it, it doesn't realize it's boiling and eventually it, it's boiled, right? So this is some stuff that if we do early enough in life, we won't have to face dementia. Is that accurate to say? Without a doubt, Matt, I believe that Alzheimer's is optional. Yes. So my generation, I'm in my late 30s, mm-hmm. my generation does not need to have Alzheimer's. Very, very, very few right. people have the genetics that set them up where it's very likely that they'll get an early uh, onset Alzheimer's or they will definitely get Alzheimer's. And, and right. that is just such a small number of people. And yet we have this wild demographic shift as baby boomers are aging 
And even for them, there's a lot of dementia that can be prevented. From The Lancet, there's a, a 2020 article that came out of The Lancet Commission for Alzheimer's, and it, this got clouded by COVID, of course, because it all came out in 2020. But it, they, they claim this is a very reputable UK-based uh, medical journal from the conventional side that says 40% of dementias can be prevented by modifiable risk factors. These are things like smoking, alcohol consumption, pollution, so air pollution, right. diabetes, obesity. So there are things that we know today, you know, and, and then being in the neurohacking, biohacking space, we just put other layers on top of right. it. But we know today from a conventional perspective, so many things we can do to intervene. And as you're mentioning, this isn't just for people over 65. Alzheimer's starts decades before you right. start noticing right. you're not finding that word or you're yep. misplacing your keys. Decades before you notice that your brain isn't working the way it did five or 10 years ago, there are changes happening in the brain that we have control over. Right. And so getting started earlier and preventing it is, of course, what I advocate for. We, we have much better outcomes if we intervene the moment someone starts to notice changes Right. And it's just hard to measure prevention, right? It's much easier to take somebody who's right. got dementia, got diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and, and prove see, that we can reverse it. Right. A lot of happiness is the things, how we filter things through the brain, right? I mean, if, if the brain's not functioning, uh, then nothing else is functioning, right? I mean, if, 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 you're, if we're having issues with the way it fires, the synapses fires, the way it, you're not going to find happiness. I'm just going to say it that way because typically in, in dementia cases and uh, so I actually, my background is um, I do own a, uh, with some partners, a 32 bed uh, dementia unit, dementia and senior care unit. So that's, uh, so I'm very, it was very excited to have you on the show today. I knew Dr. Dale Bredesen's work to some degree because we've studied it and th I thought, how can we apply this? Um, because it is, Things that you have that are things that you have to actually actively be uh, doing. It's not a pill, right? It's not yeah. with and like with most things in medicine, a pill is only coding the symptoms. It's not actually addressing the disease, right? And so, so where do you want to go from here as far as kind of what we can do to have happier, healthier brains? Yeah, you you. There's a lot that we <laughs> directions we can go there, but um, so dementia and depression uh -huh. are mm -hmm. very closely linked, and depending on who you're talking to, one one begets the other, right? Like mm -hmm. you can imagine, as you start to lose your mind, as you right. start to lose your memories, there's that begets depression. Although there are some many cases of dementia where people are perfectly happy, right? <laughs> like they're right. just in that ignorance. <laughs> right, place. ignorance is bliss. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's also an argument that depression leads to dementia. So that when people have long-term depression, long-term uh, sleep deprivation, and then long-term anxiety, and certainly PTSD, PTSD actually increases your risk of dementia by two and a half times. Wow. So as does caregiving, um, caregiving for someone with dementia increases your risk of being diagnosed with dementia later wow. on as well. So stress, depression, anxiety, all tend in that direction. And, and part of it, right, you can imagine, you're, you're, it's so much work for your brain to be depressed, right? There's not, a, there's not a lot of energy. And when your right. brain has more energy, when you're not on that blood sugar spike and drop, when mm -hmm. you're getting consistent energy, you have enough neurotransmitters, right? You have enough amino acids or proteins to support neurotransmitter synthesis. You're less likely to be depressed. You're more likely to have the energy that it takes to create memories, build new skills, take on complex tasks, executive function, um, memory, you know, problem solving memory, all of those things that are associated with clear cognitive function. And so these go hand in hand. And we see foundationally that when we are meditating or doing some sort of stress management, maybe it's mm -hmm. prayer, involvement in community, these things that support happiness um, and reduce depression, and anxiety, exercise, of course, good sleep, good food, all of these foundational pieces support good, healthy cognitive function later on in life. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned having a memory care facility. Mm -hmm. What happened in, in my world was that I was trained by Dr. Bredesen in 2017, and I was skeptical, right, because I had been told. Oh, go ahead. Can we? And I and I want to make sure. So, tell us who Dr. Bredesen is, so that the so that the listeners, because you and I know who Dr. Bredesen is. Yeah. But but who is Dr. Bredesen, and and why is he so important to to the work you do? 
Yes, and Dr. Dale Bredesen is a mentor of mine, um, wonderful guy, just such a stand-up human being. And he has really pioneered this space of changing the story, right? So many people go to the neurologist and are told that there's nothing you can do. Here's some Aricept or some Namenda, some medications that are for, you know, on label for dementia. Uh, they don't work very well. Put your affairs in order. The, there's, it's just a slope downhill. And Dr. Bredesen wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. This was published in 2017. So not mm. that long ago, right. just five, six I, years ago. Right. And in 2013, 14, he published the first case studies showing that dementia and Alzheimer's could be reversed. There was another 100 participants, 100 people per, 100, they weren't participants in a study. There were, there were 100 cases that were then again published in a, in a peer-reviewed journal showing, um, you know, 100 times that, the, that dementia and Alzheimer's had been reversed. And then they've also done a trial, clinical trial on 25 participants um, where they, these are participants, they, they go into a clinical trial, it's a feasibility trial, just showing that it's possible to do this. And what they found were really incredible results. 84% of the time, they are getting improvement in cognitive function over the course of a nine-month intervention on the Bredesen protocol. Mm -hmm. So that protocol is detailed in, in his book at the end of Alzheimer's um, and also in the end of Alzheimer's program. And he has his most recent book is The First Survivors of Alzheimer's, where a handful of um, people who have done his protocol shared their personal stories. Wow. So Dr. Bredesen was trained at Duke um, University, I believe, maybe Yale. Uh, don't quote yeah. me on that. But he's an, um, um, an MD mm -hmm. who worked for many years at, in a lab studying, he, he'll say studying Alzheimer's, studying, right. studying Alzheimer's in mice uh -huh. and looking for drug interven interventions. And um, he'll tell you his wife is a is a functional medicine provider, <laughs> and she was like, you know, where is you're going to end up right. is in back in functional medicine, back That's in naturopathic funny. medicine, looking at lifestyle related um, interventions. And sure enough, that is the foundation of Dr. Bredesen's protocol. And that's what, what we do both at Solsari at my clinic. Uh -huh. It's what we talk about on the Reverse Alzheimer's Summit um, that's going live June 14th of 2022. Uh -huh. And then it's what we offer an immersive experience in over at Marama. Okay, so let's talk. Uh, now, thank you for that answer. So let's talk about Marama. And, and so what, what led to, so this is a, a, a residential care facility that specializes in Alzheimer's and dementia. Is that accurate? That's correct, yeah. And what we really offer is an immersive experience mm -hmm. in this protocol. So okay. In 2017, I'd been trained by Dr. Bredesen, and I started seeing patients in my office um, who had dementia and who were more enthusiastic and more committed than I was because they they had heard the stories and they had they believed right. right. And I hadn't seen it yet, so I had my skeptic hat on still. But they came in enthusiastic, and my first patient, Linda. She came in with her husband, and uh, she had a 2 out of 30 on a MOCA. So uh, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment is this validated worksheet, essentially a form that we do with patients mm -hmm. to screen them for dementia. And you want to get a 30 out of 30. That's a perfect score. Normal is 26 and over. Mm -hmm. By the time you're getting into the teens, so like 16, 17, this is significant cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. Measurable cognitive decline is anything under 24 or so. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, this woman, Linda, my one of my first dementia patients, she came in with a mocha of two. Oh my. So I would ask, yeah, very severe disease. I mm -hmm. would ask her a question and I could kind of see the wheels in her head spinning. But by the time she went to answer, she had forgotten the question. Mm -hmm. She might be able to answer with a couple yes or no's here and there, but you can see she was easily fatigued. Um, she, she had this big, bright personality that was underneath it all. Like her, her humanity was still there. She had this mm -hmm. huge, beautiful smile. She wore these bright clothes and hats and belts and purses and, you know, all the accessories and the shoes. It was just great. She, you could tell, and her husband was just heartbroken. You know, he mm -hmm. wanted his wife back right. so badly. And, um, her handwriting had been affected. So it was at the slant and it was kind of shaky and her letters were really small. And, you know, she was just a shell of herself of who she had been. Well, they did it all. She had her amalgams removed. So she had all of her dental work done. She went on a ketogenic diet immediately. They started ballroom dancing three or four times a week. Hmm. They got out of their moldy bedroom and moved in. They actually just moved into a different part of their home. They lived mm -hmm. in Northern Mexico and they, I mean, they did it all. They did all of the supplements they got. She got on the hormone replacement. They did everything. And seven weeks later, six or seven weeks later, she came back and her mocha was a seven out of 30. Mm -hmm. So her experience of the world was completely different. Uh, she, 
was bickering with her husband about something that had happened the night before or on the mm-hmm. way in. I mean, mm-hmm. it was, she was now answering in not fully complete sentences right. that were always coherent, but they were there. She was right. coming back. Right. And I was in disbelief. I mean, like I, it, my first thought was like, what did we do wrong six weeks ago? You know, like <laughs> how did, how did we mess this up? Right. And then my next thought was like, what? Like, is this really happening? And so then I started crying, you know, and, and then thinking about it the rest of the day, it was like, if this is possible for Linda, Mm -hmm. what is possible for everyone else who doesn't have a two out of 30 on their mocha, who has a 22 out of 30 on their mocha. And what we found in the clinic is that when we can intervene, when someone's in their fifties, sixties, they've got a 22 out of 30 on the mocha, well, they're getting back to a 30. Really? They're getting back there within six and nine months. Oh yeah. Consistently. It's amazing. And so, you know, then we think like what's possible for people who are in their thirties and forties, Right. we never have to look at, we never have to consider this, Mm -hmm. right? But now this isn't a pill. This isn't easy, right? This isn't hook me up to an IV and I'll never get dementia. This isn't let me swallow a pill and I'll never get dementia. This is okay. What's, what's the plan? What's the game plan? And that's diet and exercise. And I'm happy to go into that more. But so after seeing Linda, after seeing multiple patients like hers reversed their cognitive decline. Mm-hmm. I had a little bit of a reputation and I had people then emailing and saying, Hey, I've heard of this Bredesen protocol. It takes work. I really want my uncle or my dad or my mom right. or my aunt to be getting the benefit of this. Where do I send them? Right. I, you know, much of our audience is sort of the sandwich generation that I can completely relate to, right? They've got kids who are in school. Mm-hmm. They've got a full-time job. Yeah. They've got a house to manage and they really want the best for their yeah. parents but they like, how do they juggle it all? Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for support from an immersive kind of experience. And so when I looked around, there wasn't any place that was doing that. I'm so glad that you have um, your fingers in a spot because I am hoping I'll brainwash you today. Of course. I'm I'm hoping you will brainwash me as well. In fact, I'm going to introduce you to people that (laughs) you can talk to that hopefully brainwash us all. But uh, fantastic because we need more of them. We have a waiting list of like 12 people right now. Mm -hmm. So we, we need, need more places like Marama where uh, people want this. They want the best for their brain health, right? It's, it, this isn't rocket science. It's just putting the best of what we know in the science, the best lifestyle, the best mm-hmm. food, the best exercise program, the best caregiving in the place where seniors with dementia live. Right. Because as I was having conversations, um, there was a, a patient I had who was a consultant for senior living facilities. And she's uh-huh. like, you got to come in and give talks and like right. tell everybody about this. <laughs> and I was like, but if they're being fed, if they're eating cake and cookies right. while I give the talk and that's what's available and there's TVs on and it's three right. TVs on every room. Right. It just doesn't work. Right. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. It's information. It's not transformation. Right. And, and so how many, how many rooms do you actually have there at Marama? Yeah. So we only have 12. So okay. the Marama we opened, um, we, this, this idea happened in 2018. We closed, or I guess it was 2019 was mm-hmm. when we kind of, the concept came up and then we closed at the end of 2019, um, and then we opened our doors March 1st of 2020, and the world shut down the next week. So it's been yes. an exciting ride. I bet. And, and yeah. typically, are you seeing people that are that are elderly that have that are seniors that already have some cognitive dementia and stuff like that, and they're just really trying to come back from that? Is that kind of what you're treating there? Yeah. So we have a spectrum. Um, when I started Marama in, in uh, it was December of 2019 when we, we first announced that we were doing this and we had, again, like we had a wait list. There was a lot of interest and um, there was a woman who contacted me who was support is, is still supporting a very dear friend of hers who has severe dementia. She has a mocha of zero oh, wow. and I, so she really wanted her to come mm-hmm. to Marama and I was, I, I asked her to leave one of our 12 beds available, mm-hmm. um, to other people where I had more confidence. Right. And so fast forward, you know, COVID hit and we stayed half full because, um, I, you know, half, half the number yep. of residents, yep. half yep. the number of staff, half the amount of risk in terms of COVID. Mm-hmm. So we stayed half full for about 18, 12 months at least. And then, you know, we filled slowly, um, after that, just making sure that we could m- m- keep that risk managed. Sure. So then um, Kim is her name. Kim reached out again and said, hey, at the, kind of a year into COVID, would you reconsider? Right. And so this patient still has a mocha of zero. And um, 
And I said, yes, okay, you know, you're, you're mm-hmm. persistent. Let's reconsider. And I agreed, like, I do think Marama is the best place for her. But, you know, my, my thought was that we needed people who were kind of in this middle stage in like the 16, yep, 17, right. 18 on the MOCA right, right, stage. Right. So you I have start, more right. confidence. Yeah. Right. So she moves in and she's essentially nonverbal, uh, very unstable. Mm-hmm. And she had been doing the Bredesen protocol at home Um and I don't know what changed, but she has, she is a miracle. And she read someone's name tag at one point. She just read a staff member's name tag. She spells her name out loud. Um, she said, I, I, she's thin and kind of runs cold. And so I go over there and I'll like rub her shoulders. And she looks at, looks at me and says, that feels good. Right. You know, just, she has the ability to communicate, say, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hungry, Mm -hmm. communicate in a way that she didn't before. Mm -hmm. Um, And so my learning from that experience was to never again tell someone there isn't hope. Right. Because I have seen miracles happen Mm -hmm. too consistently. Now, of course, we have more confidence the earlier on. You're moving them a percentage of where they're at. Not You're not Mm -hmm. necessarily going to go from zero to, to 25 or 30, right. Or maybe even 15, I don't know, because the yeah. damage, it's kind of like the damage has probably been done at that point, right. There's, it's not as uh, reversible, I would assume. Is that. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's what we're seeing. No, that being said, you know, we've only, she's been there a year, uh-huh. um, a little over a year. And so I don't know what's possible right. in two, three, right. four years. I right. don't know We're we're all learning. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I think is exciting, um, is that there are these like beta, the way I think of beta amyloid plaques at sometimes I'm like, they're my nemesis. I'm like, why is everybody talking about that when there's like so much else to talk about? And it's like right. this dead end. And yet there's this value that I, I think of the beta amyloid plaques and the tau proteins as being um, not synonymous with Alzheimer's, but the scar tissue of what forms oh. when there's a why, right? There's a reason mm. there's toxins or infections right. or something causing inflammation that then creates scar tissue. And if we can get rid of all the whys and then use these medications, some of the drugs that help mm. break down those amyloid plaques and tau proteins, then we might be able to get even mm-hmm. better responses right. and have people like this patient who's at a zero out of 30, maybe she could recover completely. Right. Right. That plus stem cells, you know, if mm-hmm. we can start to throw a lot at it, mm-hmm. then maybe we can. And that's exciting to me. But what's more exciting to me is revert is preventing, just like not even having to yeah, yeah, go yeah. there. Right, right. Right. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, that's a great segue into, okay. So for the, you know, the people of us that are walking around, the people that are listening or watching the show, what are the things that we really need to be focused on t- for our own prevention and then potentially that we could share with our relatives, family, whatever that may be? So, so how, do we, how do we keep from getting dementia? Yeah, so again, this is common sense, just not mm-hmm. common practice, right? right? So exercise, moderate, vigorous exercise. You, you want to be getting about 200 minutes a week with a, your heart rate at about 75 to 85% um, of max heart rate. Mm-hmm. So you're pushing it. And then there's four different types of exercise. So you have cardio, which of course you want to get that helps with circulation. You want to get strength that helps with a lot of the signaling that goes to our brain. What we've, what we know from the literature right now is that the best exercise for cognitive function, whether you're recovering from like a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, or you're preventing dementia or reversing dementia is exercise, physical exercise combined with cognitive exercise. Oh. So where you're doing math problems or you're listing mm-hmm. the 50 states and their capitals or all the presidents in the right order, whatever it is. Uh, and those things sound kind of boring to me, but like right. if you also um, so are memorizing, you're thinking and doing thinking and exercising. So if you're, you can, you can walk, but walking is not enough. So if, mm-hmm. if anyone takes something home from this, if you take one thing home today, walking is not enough for cognitive function when it comes to exercise. And when you can get vigorous cardio strength, and then some combination of of mental effort with physical effort that is that exponentially increases the, um, the benefits of exercise. And then the fourth thing that you can do, which also is highly beneficial is contrast oxygen therapy. So a lot of people are familiar with maybe like Wim Hof and like the Mm -hmm. cold therapies Mm -hmm. or with, um, calorie restricted eating, like fasting Mm -hmm. or, or intermittent fasting. So this is the same sort of idea. Exercise is the same. This is this hormetic effect where you're, you're, 
increasing the stress on the system in a way that's calculated mm -hmm. so that you increase adaptability and flexibility so that the system is more resilient. Mm -hmm. And so you can do that with oxygen. And this is why Olympians, you know, go to elevation to train. Right. Um, th th that's an erythropoietin effect where you get more red blood cells, but contrast oxygen therapy where you're working, you're exercising and you're hooked up to a mass mm -hmm. and an oxygen reservoir. Mm -hmm. So you go back and forth between negative oxygen and positive or concentrated mm -hmm. oxygen at about 80%. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a device called Livo2, which that's what we use at Marama. And that's what I recommend my patients use. Um, and it's called, this, now, say that again, because I didn't quite, what's it called? Live or Live O2, like oxygen, oh, L-I-V-E-O-2. Gotcha. O2. O2. Okay. Yeah, and it's contrast oxygen therapy. And so oh. you go back and forth between positive and negative. And this is like, it's it's detoxifying. It helps kill, take, kill off senescent cells. It helps um, with mitochondrial density per cell. So you help mm -hmm. with energy production. There's the physics of um, the contrast oxygen therapy flipping back and forth is basically it, it increases the diameter of your blood vessels and then shrinks them. So you get this pressure gradient. It, and, and that's yeah. probably supposed to pop the plaque or something out of the vessels. Is that what that's doing or what's that doing? Probably not popping. I hope because that might lead to a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Oops, really in the, <laughs> in the microvasculature, so in right. the capillary beds where there's single cells and, uh -huh. and nutrients are meant to diffuse, um, the oxygen's meant to diffuse ac across those capillary beds. What we sometimes get are these like brown out areas or gray out, right? They're not fully ischemic. So they're right. not necrotic tissue. Like it's totally dead. Right. Like you would get after a stroke or, you know, if mm -hmm. like with you, if you had gangrene or something dramatic, right. but this is like that after an inflammatory event. So after maybe you bumped your head or after you've had an infection or after there's been a, a toxin or there's an inflammatory event that, that persists. So like chronic mm -hmm. inflammation that persists, that pushes on those capillary beds. And now they're just not working as efficiently. Mm -hmm. And when you take that pressure gradient and kind of expand and contract, you get better blood flow through it and the mm -hmm. whole thing can heal. Got and it. so it goes from, from not getting optimal blood, blood flow to um to improving basically mm -hmm. okay and yeah. so are you using is this as a mask you said and are you using this while you're like on a treadmill or you're using it on a recumbent bike or kind of what's the because you, you're, exactly. you're you're talking about your heart rate has to be at 75 or 85 percent of your max right yeah. so so you're you, and and then you're doing this for 10 15 20 minutes 30 minutes at a time or Exactly. Yeah, oh, you okay. nailed it. So no, no, I actually don't. This is I've, this is new to me. So I'm actually just asking, like, like um, I've not heard of this. Yeah. yeah so and you're on at Marama. We have a bike. We have a Schwinn Aerodyne. Okay. They don't uh -huh. pay me to say that, but that's what seems to work best. This show um, brought to you by Schwinn Aerodyne. <laughs> Um, oh, but other people use an, a treadmill. You cannot go out for a walk with right. this, right? Because it's Cause a great oxygen. big device. Oh, is yeah, it? Yeah, okay. it's oxygen. It's an yeah. oxygen concentrator. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, So you need something. People have tried it with a rower, but then there's tubing, and so right. you get all you yeah. know tangled up in that. So, so the bike probably makes don't... sense because you're fairly... Yeah, you know, stationary yeah. to some degree. Yeah, exactly. So exercise is one. So foundational pieces are exercise. Uh -huh. um, diet is another big one. So we recommend the ketogenic diet. In January of 2022, there was a paper published out of Florida. I think it's Florida State University. Um, don't uh -huh. quote me on that. It might be wrong, but I can give you the link in the show notes. Okay. Um, for there was a, a, again a small feasibility trial, but there's more and more uh, data suggesting that a ketogenic diet can reverse cognitive decline. And I would say in our program, it does about fifty percent of the lifting. Really? So, yeah. Whoa. Um, and I would re like try it. I've I've been in ketosis the last few weeks, and what I get from it is an an extra hour and a half in my day. I wake up at wow. five a.m. Ready, ready to go, go. and so yeah. And if I'm if I'm on that sugar roller coaster, mm -hmm. it's like. 6 30 and I'm struggling to get up. So, right. uh, that's me personally. Uh -huh. Um, other people, it's like my, their brains just turn back on. It's amazing how big of a difference that can make. Hmm. Um, so, and it's an ancestral diet, right? So, right. so a lot of people are like worried they're going to have to be in ketosis forever. That's not the idea. Burning fat for fuel a hundred percent of the time is just as bad as burning sugar for fuel a hundred percent of the time. But what most of us have done, contrary to our hunter gatherer ancestors that we are, you know, based on mm -hmm. our, our bodies and metabolism are based on, uh, is that we stay in glycolysis or burning sugar for fuel 100% of our lives. Oh. 
And so we don't go back and forth. And what you get from a ketogenic diet going in and out of ketosis is one, it's a very brain healing diet. Mm -hmm. Two, it's anti-inflammatory, especially if you're doing it right and having a lot of veggies. Um, And then three, it, it, it creates this metabolic flexibility and you change the fuel in your brain. Your brain prefers to burn ketones for fuel. And you can imagine right, our hunter-gatherer ancestors who couldn't find glucose in the environment to eat, right. you didn't want their brain to stop working. You, you would have, if you were divinely designing a human brain, right, you would want your brain to turn on so that you could find that next food source. Right. And that's kind of exactly what happens. As our brains age, they become less uh, sensitive to both insulin and glucose. So changing, like, it's just, a, the body just amazes me. I mean, it just <laughs> blows my mind, Right. That we can run out of one source of fuel and just put in a different type, right. and it and it works even better. It's like what? How, this is so cool. And this so, is why I called you the expert. But I won't. I, I, I'll use some other term. I'll figure out some other term by the end of the show. But this is my point that you you love this stuff, and I love that you love this stuff. This is how things get done. So ketogenic it's diet. Fun. <laughs> ketogenic diet. It's a it's a you know whole foods. Mm-hmm. It's this isn't just like bacon and like the keto whatever keto ice cream bars from Costco. Like no right, no. Right. Really like whole foods good stuff. I had last night um my mom's in town and I've got I've got her on the ketogenic diet, right? So we have these like lettuce cups with with ground turkey and a bunch mm-hmm. of veggies and onions and mushrooms and Mm-hmm. So filling, so satisfying, so delicious. Fast food in my house is greens, like the leafy greens, the power greens, uh-huh. organic power greens in a saute pan with some olive oil uh-huh. and salt and and whatever good spices you have in the cabinet. See, and like you're, that, you're even making this sound so good. good. Your, your, oh, your passion so and your energy is making. Do you want to come on and just do your own cooking show? Because I'm I'm getting I'm getting hungry just listening to you, and I don't even eat turkey. But I'm like all of a sudden I'm like, hey, you know what? That turkey sounded pretty good. It's pretty good, and you can do. There are um, there are some people. I it's hard to do vegan keto, yeah, and I right. what I recommend is like a like vegan in the summer and maybe a little bit more animal protein in the, in, in in the, the winter, winter and yep. kind of like seasonal eating. And you, again, you don't have to be in ketosis all the time. So like in the summer when there's all these amazing seasonal fruits in, in right. season, like go for it. But I think a lot of with diets, a lot of the benefit is from the Delta. It's from the change. Oh. So when you go from keto to vegan, you, you get this benefit because you're asking your body to change its mm. metabolism. So you right. get like the senescence and, and, you know, you get all this, you get all these great things happening. So when you're going um, from Oreos to <laughs> <laughs> that's actually to kind kale. of painful. <laughs> yeah, I don't need Oreos. I don't know. But, right, American well, diet. Right? Well, we, yeah, when yeah. people go from a standard American diet to a ketogenic diet or to a vegan diet, you can get like this keto flu. Yeah, so yeah, I had that once. Yeah, yeah, headache, fatigue. I was like, I, I felt like yeah, it felt like a flu. It felt like a mild cold actually, um, mm-hmm. and it took two or three days for it to kind of kick over, right? To kind of get the fuel burning from sugar to, to fats or, or ketones, I guess. Yeah. And the whole time your brain is like donuts. They're the donuts. <laughs> I remember I fasted one time where I tried to, I didn't, I, w- I didn't even know what I was doing. It was just like, you know what? I'm just going to stop eating food for three days. Cause that's a great idea. And so I'll just drink water. And by day two, I opened the cabinet and of course, back then it was all just kind of traditional diet stuff. I mean, I, I was starting to lean in, obviously I'm starting to fast. But I opened the cabinet and there's like a bag of sugar up on the top. And I and, and I, I don't even know why, because I didn't bake. I was living by myself. I mean, I was single at the time. And I was like, I took a deep breath in. I was like, and I could literally smell white sugar in a bag on the top shelf. I was so like, give me the sugar. Give me something to eat. I, I lasted about two and a half days and then I ordered a pizza. But I've gotten better since then. <laughs> I've gotten better. I try to do the intermittent fasting. I do because so many people come on the show and tell me I should. So I, I try to do the intermittent fasting, try to not break that with crazy craziness. Like today I had, you'll be proud, I had salmon, uh, salad, and I think I did have some like homemade potato salad. But So I did do some carbs in there. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. You don't have to be keto all the time and right. and you don't have to be keto, right? Like, right. It, but, but, I, but the more I you can lean, it's a good idea. Yeah. The more you can go that way, the better for the brain health. We're not saying you have to do it. We're just saying if you don't want to have Alzheimer's, maybe you should consider this, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you don't want diabetes and right. if you don't want heart disease and if you don't want kind yeah. of all of the other complex chronic diseases associated with, you know, modern, and, the with modern world. Cause, cause basically yeah. what we're, and, and you had already touched on this, but basically it's not that key. It's not that it's just to do keto because of the brain health. It's actually because it decreases inflammation in the body, right? That's what, that's kind of the thought behind the whole 
ketosis and and it's not eating a pound of bacon in the morning because that's got fat and proteins in it. That's not what we're saying. We're saying veggies, whole foods, things like that. But ultimately, we're trying to to reduce inflammation because inflammation is the precursor to almost all disease. That I, from my understanding, as a a, a guy who studied no has no medical background whatsoever other than <laughs> being involved in senior care. <laughs> well, inflammation is certainly involved, but yeah. what it, when when people say like inflammation is the cause of all disease, I say, right. well, what causes inflammation, right? right. And so yep. that's that's like kind of what right. we're discussing here is like, right. okay, how do we do this? Yep. You make sure that you're eating the right stuff, you're exercising, you're sleeping. So if somebody has sleep apnea or is in any way at risk, if they're snoring, I I have little thin, many old ladies who have horrible sleep apnea, right? So you don't have to be overweight. Kind of there's this idea that it's a male who's overweight Mm -hmm. who's going to have sleep apnea. And that's not always the case. And there are these great devices. Now you can do a watch with a ring overnight that, you know, beams up to some satellite somewhere, (laughs) all of your sleep data for some sleep expert to look at and then tell you if you have sleep apnea and, um, for people who are Medicare eligible, like all of this can get covered and you can get a sleep device. Now, if there, what I will say there, the caveat is that there are a lot of sleep medicine docs that there's this threshold and it's arbitrary, right? It's like you have to have five or more oh, apnea right. events episodes, per 30 right. seconds yeah. or 60 episodes per so, so many amount of time. Right. And I call bullshit. So I don't know mm-hmm. if I can do that on the show, but you can say that I on do. The show. Um, if you're having apnea at night, that is basically minor brain damage every night. And as somebody who focuses on your brain, like that is not at all okay with me. Right. So we need to figure it out. So do the sleep study, but just when somebody tells you it's normal, triple check with somebody who's been trained by Dr. Bredesen or who, who cares that you not have any, um, because this can be, it's pretty simple. Like there's something, things as simple as mouth tape. So mm-hmm. you can, I know this is a little bit counterintuitive, but you can tape your mouth shut and that will force <laughs> now, you to be. <laughs> that sounds like something. Have you been talking to my wife? Is that, is that what this is about? Cause <laughs> mouth well, tape. I think snore. she would, I think, no, now, you know, when I snore, here's, I, I snore specifically when I do one thing before bed. Drink. No, it's not drinking. Oh. Gluten. Gluten. Oh, interesting. Hands down Gluten. Hands down every time. If I have any gluten past noon, basically one noon or one, right? So if I eat some bread or something with lunch, uh, no no problem. But anytime I eat anything probably after 5 or 6 o'clock that has gluten in it, I snore that night every single time. And I've actually uh, I've got a good friend of mine who's a physician, and I told him about it, and he, you know, his, uh, told he and his wife, and his wife started tracking it, and same thing. Anytime that he had gluten in the evening, snored every time. So I'm like, yeah, there's something about, and it's not that I'm that stuffed up. I, it's just something about the gluten makes me snore. So here's, there's a fun fact for you. So maybe we need to explore that a little bit. Yeah. Well think how many guys, you know, drink a beer oh, at right. night yeah. or, you know, yeah. Having pasta or right. so yeah, much exactly. gluten I used to eat tons of pasta. Yeah. At mm-hmm. night. Yeah. At night. Um, yeah. Gluten free diet. I'm all, all about it. Um, for everybody, any, any time, regardless of whether or not you store it. But the mouth tape, your wife, somebody's wife is going to thank me for this because <laughs> it's so simple <laughs> to just, just put the mouth tape on. Go down to the hardware store on. that's gray. <laughs> it comes in a thing called duct tape, and you just strap it on your face. It's super cheap. Just cut it in four-inch strips. <laughs> Covers the whole thing, right? And if you have, a, if you have a beard like mine, it's okay because it, it, it'll, it won't stick to the skin as much. But, but okay, so, so, so they make mouth tape. I did not know that. Yeah, don't do, don't do the duct tape. That okay. sounds really painful. Um, and, and it's probably full and, of chemicals. So yeah, probably not yeah, the best probably. thing to stick on your mouth all night. Yeah. But it, it, this really, I know it sounds crazy, but it can make a big difference. The other thing are the breathe right strips. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I say the name brand because the generics just like do not have the same effect. Interesting. Um, but that can help. Um, and then the, a dentist can fit an oral device to keep the airway open. So some people are like, no, I can't do the machine. I can't do the right. CPAP. I can't right, do right. the APAP. Although my patients tell me that the APAP, the alternating pressure is the mm. Cadillac of CPAP. So if you're, if you're talking to somebody about mm. getting one or you're looking at one online, mm. get the alternating pressure because then it adjusts to how you, you, the pressure that you need. It's not continuous like the regular mm. CPAP. And then you can get, they have these cool pillows now. So they're really comfortable. They're not like this massive mask. So play with it. I mean, sleep right. apnea is such a big deal for yeah. so many diseases, but especially for cognitive function. Wow. So being aggressive about treating this, regardless of your age, is I believe one of the most important things. 
Dental work is the other thing. Um, I was having a conversation with a colleague yesterday about how if, if someone comes into me and they say I can choose, they have significant dental stuff going on and they can choose between seeing me or seeing the dentist. I say, I love you. Peace. Go see the dentist. Right. Because that is health starts in the gut and the gut starts in the mouth. We can't, like, we're not, not going like to that. I've not actually heard that. We've had, I've had Dr. Gundry on here. I've had several other health experts. I've never heard that the gut health starts in the, well, you're, you're, and when we say the mouth, you're talking about the gums and the dental stuff. We're not talking about food, obviously, right? But, but all of, all the, of above, the above, but right? I've, never, I've never heard it said in line with dentistry, I guess is my point. Dentistry is so crucial. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had a patient where we're, we, you know, I maybe wasn't pushing hard enough or I didn't say it in that way. And we just tread water for a year and we're going like, why are we not getting traction? Why are we not making progress? And it ends up that they've got something egregious going on in their mouth and then they get it taken care of. And all of a sudden, like things are turning around, things are better. And it just ha has happened too many times in my career that I don't like now I say it and I say it's early. Hmm, like, interesting. That and is so, paramount. And so gum disease type stuff or I mean, what's happening that's causing the issue, I guess. Yeah, great question. So there's a few things. Um, so one airway, we talked about airway and, and how not being able to keep the airway open. And there are dentists who specialize in maintaining that, that patent airway, especially at night while you're asleep. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's mercury. So mercury yep. is extremely neurotoxic. And thank God they don't do this anymore. But uh, in the 80s, 90s, you know, early 2000s, they would put yep. in amalgams. Yep. Yeah, I had them. Had I had them a bunch. Out. Yep, I yep. did too. And we got to get them out. And then we need to assess if there is a mercury burden. Mercury, again, highly neurotoxic of yep. all of the heavy metals. It's the most neurotoxic. Had that too. Had that yeah. too. Yeah. Because I don't think. So I'm I don't, glad. And I want to do make this point in the show. You need to visit with a dentist who knows how to take them out correctly. Because I just had them drilled out. And guess what? Add mercury poisoning. And so, and that was a whole fun show. So, and I'm, and I, I need to be retested, honestly, but yeah. So it's not just go to your dentist and say, I need these out, but you need somebody that knows how to damn them. Right. They put the stuff in there and they, I mean, it's because you don't want it to go in your, you, basically, if you're just drilling them out, you're just releasing that into your bloodstream. I mean, you're just going, you're t making it almost from bad to worse, right? You're, you're, it's like what was bad in your mouth is now bad in all of your bone structure and, and your bloodstream. <laughs> so and your brain and your brain, yeah. right. So, so yeah, if definitely get them out, but you need to find somebody who knows how to take them out and not poison you. Yeah. I refer to biological dentists. Okay. So that's usually who you want to see. They know how to do it. There's a smart S M A R T is mm -hmm. the acronym that's used for how to remove mercury in a, in a way that takes all of that into consideration. And right. th like to your point, the highest risk is when they go in and then they slowly, especially as they get older. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you've had them in there for 20, 30, 40 years, they, they degrade and they, if you drink something hot or you're chew on something hard, they're releasing a little bit of mercury into your system kind of like on a drip, like consistently, Perfect. super scary. And then the other scary time is when they come out. Yeah. And so to exactly what you're saying, that's when you have high risk of being exposed to even more. So you want to have that done in a really a smart way. Right. Um, and then the third thing is these infections. So we know that Pigeon Javalis, which is one of the, the bacteria that causes gum disease, there's a, basically four um, infections that can happen in the body that directly cause in neuroinflammation that can lead to beta amyloid plaque and tau protein formation. So it can lead to Alzheimer's essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's P. gingivalis in the mouth, herpes, like mm -hmm. simplex one and two, cold swords, you know, mm -hmm. genital herpes, mm -hmm. um, COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of us can relate to this, and then Lyme. So Lyme is Borrelia burgdorferi, burgdorferi it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. So Borrelia um, has a neuro Lyme component that can, can is found, you know, when they do autopsies on people with um, with dementias, it's the Lyme spirochetes are found in the beta in, in the plaques and tangles. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things with these plaques and tangles is that they are antimicrobial. And so they're there to protect us. Again, they're like the scar tissue that comes after the why. There's a trigger. Mm -hmm. And so that scar tissue is being created in an effort to protect your brain. So it's not that the, the plaques and tangles are evil. <laughs> they're there to protect right. you. And what we don't want to do is trigger them, their formation. And so one of the best ways to do that is to 
keep our mouths really clean so that we never have that P. gingivalis that can then be introduced into the bloodstream and then go into the brain. Is there some type of symptom to this? I'm not even going to say it. This, <laughs> this PJ disease. Is there some type of, is there some type of symptom there? Because I need to know right now. Is there anything? <laughs> is it's like, what you want to look at my teeth or I mean, what, what is the, uh, what's the symptom of that? Cause I've not heard of that. Yeah, good. So gingivitis, gingivitis. Oh, gingivitis. Right? This thing okay, has yeah, gingivitis. Okay. Um, but also the way I look for it, the, the way I screen my patients for it is a, a marker on blood work called LPPLA2. This is um, a, a marker that is often associated with gum disease. Mm -hmm. And what we see is it's a cardiovascular and inflammatory marker. It, it predicts cardiovascular risk. So um, strokes and, mm -hmm. and heart attacks can happen often after a dental cleaning or dental work huh. when these bacteria are introduced into the, blood, the bloodstream. So it can go to your brain. It's also significantly associated with heart disease. So really, and I mean, we've heard this, right? If you don't floss your teeth, you're at higher risk of strokes and plaques and stuff. This mm -hmm. is, I hope you've heard this. So I have um, not. So I'm getting super scared. Thank you for all this. I'm like I, well, super paranoid now. My wife, who's a daughter of a dentist, you know, she's in there flossing all the time. She's got dental tools. She's doing her own teeth cleaning stuff. And, and I'm flossing not very often at all. So now I'm starting to go, oh, great. High, increased risk for, <laughs> risk for stroke. So I knew she would outlive me, so that's fine. But I, I just don't want it to be by like two or three decades. It'd be nice if we were a little closer together on that well, deal. Well, I hope this, this conversation is inspiring yes, you it's freaking to floss me out. your teeth every yeah, day. Yeah, it's freaking me out. So thanks. Floss. I'm just writing that floss. down. Floss. <laughs> Write okay. that one down. Yes, definitely. I did. I did. You can put a little sticky note on the bathroom yes. mirror. Floss. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go home and give her credit today. Uh, saying, <laughs> you know what? You're, you're, you were right. You're, you're definitely, I knew you were smarter than me, but now you're also healthier and going to outlive me. So. <laughs> so those are the foundational things, right? Diet, exercise, right. sleep, stress management, dental stuff. Um, we could talk all day, I'm sure. I mean, with your, your mm. work on stress management, right. meditation, all that. Right. But I, I want to make sure we get into some more of the meat here sure, as yeah, well, which is um, toxins. So toxins come in three flavors. This is your chemical toxins, things like parabens, PCBs, petrochemicals mm -hmm. that come from gasoline additives. This is herbicides and pesticides, glyphosate, like in Roundup. So I recommend an organic ketogenic diet mm -hmm. as much as possible right. to, to keep those toxins down. Um, and then running air filters in the home, taking your shoes off at the door, mm -hmm. opening up doors and windows for an hour every day so that you can get fresh air. The, the solution to pollution is dilution for as long as we, you know, have, uh -huh. have that possibility. You've got all these kind um, of fun little sayings. <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't get, take credit for, I think that one comes from um, Walter I'm, Crinian. I, I'm going to give you credit because I don't know who he is. So <laughs> he's credit. a mentor, oh, a mentor of mine who's unfortunately passed away, mm. but he wrote a lot of the books on environmental medicine and, and oh. toxic exposure. Um, and so I've learned a ton from Dr. Bill Ray in Dallas, who also passed on. And then um, uh, Joe Pizzorno. So there are some greats in the field who I've had the privilege of learning from. And they have really, uh, they've done a lot of the science, a lot of the research and published a lot, um, in science, you know, in, in peer-reviewed, rigorously, um, scientifically reviewed journals. And there, there's so much here. And we're stuck in this rock and hard place, right, of like, again, common sense, not common practice. There's a lot right. of politics, a lot of money involved in, in us being exposed pretty ubiquitous ubiquitously excuse me to toxins uh, day in day right. out so and 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 i've been he hearing about it and we've adjusted our lifestyle a long time ago and still continue to evolve it's a never-ending process yeah. right stuff sneaks in and you don't even know and all of a sudden you're like wait a second that was supposed to be healthy totally. and it's but but basically we're we're talking when you're talking what i'm what's coming up for me is we need to stop poisoning ourselves by putting stuff on our skin, putting shampoo in our hair, putting deodorant on our body that has toxins in it. And there are, and I want to say that, you know, 10 years ago when I started doing this stuff, 15 years ago, whatever, there wasn't a lot of choices and it, they didn't work great. I mean, you, you could, you, the cleaners just really didn't clean. And finally we're just like, screw it. I'm getting the Clorox and we're bleaching the shit out of this. But, but then eventually over time, the cleaners like method and some of the other brands, they got better. Right. And so now you, you any natural grocery store, you know, Whole Foods type store, not Whole Foods, but just any type of natural grocery store is going to have deodorant and they're going to have shampoos and they're going to have, and for the most part, if you're, especially if you're just starting out, these things, you know, are, are eliminating a lot of what you're talking about when you're talking about parabens and dyes that are toxic. And, you know, we could talk about 
color, food coloring, and all that fun stuff, right? So it's just starting to educate ourselves on, hey, there's things out there that I'm putting in my body, putting on my body, that, that there are good alternatives for versus putting this diesel fuel right on my skin, right? <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, right. Yeah, and I, I mean, would even say, you know, these things are available on Amazon and, and Target. Yeah, and like that's what, true. You know, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're, they're really becoming everywhere. more mainstream. And as I said that, I remember literally cleaning auto parts when I was in high school in auto shop in the solvent that was made of oil. And and, and, and we used to wash our hands with gasoline after we painted. I mean, I grew up on a farm, so that was like a normal thing. You had paint on your hands. What did you do? You went over and got a gallon of gas and you just... And how many chemicals are going right into the body on that deal, right? So I have good reason for the mental illness I have. But I'm, I'm starting well, to detox it out. So, so the mental illness I don't want to give anyone <laughs> is like this, this overwhelm, well, right? right. Of this yep. just like par- paralysis of like, well, yeah, I can't right. avoid it. There's nothing I right. can do. So like, why would I even go? And one of the great resources I like is the EWG, um, the healthy living app. So okay, environmental working group. Okay. Yeah. EWG, the environmental work. Healthy EWG. living. EWG.org. Okay. EWG.org. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. And they have a, an app called Healthy Living, and they put out the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen list every year mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that tells us like which which foods have yeah. sh- so many herbicides and pesticides, and which ones like maybe you don't have to buy organic because right. they don't use a lot of herbicides and pesticides. So they have great lists, and they have a, an app where you can just oh, that's scan right. products. That's yeah, right. right, and it kind of tells you level of to- it's not just good or bad. It's kind of isn't it like a level of to- you know this is better exactly. than mm-hmm. than okay. Yeah, so that's a yeah, great Yeah, so resource. you can just scan the code and, mm. and that will give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Or I mean, and it is, you're right. It's like an A, B, C, or D or like a, right. on a scale of one to 10 or something. So yeah, there's a little nuance. And then you'll find your products that you like. Exactly. Um, and then, yeah. But, but, it, um, but there are things out there. I just want to say for anybody thinking, oh, I'm not, you know, da, 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 da. It, it's one, to your point, it's not, it, it's baby steps. It's not like you're going to go. I mean, if you want to go home and throw out everything you got and go to the store, that's fine. But we're really, I, I kind of like it, upgrading. I don't even like the term crowding out. It's really just upgrading, but not necessarily even spending more money. A lot of this stuff now is, is, is so mainstream that it's not like it's even that much more, if at all more. Uh, you know, it's just changing it out for kind of what's always been there for what's better for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then... Mold, we talked a little bit about mercury mm. um, as a heavy metal. So toxins come in basically these three flavors, like ice cream, right? Like right. The, the chemicals, which I think these are those lifestyle choices that uh-huh. we've been discussing, yep. Yep. and yep. those are really important. And like at, at Marama, we've made a big effort to make sure that the environment there is a really healthy healing environment. And so we use all non-toxic cleaning products, right. all organic food. Yep. Um, and we are hyper vigilant about mold. Because mold toxins can also cause cognitive decline and brain fog mm-hmm. um, and, and can be directly neurotoxic. So right. yep. we want to keep mold out of the environment. And, you know, every house has a leak here or there. We had mm-hmm. a, a garbage disposal that leaked and we had a shower that had mm-hmm. something happen. And so we just get right on top of it and make sure it's all cleaned up. Um, and then we have the, the mold inspector come and, the, mm-hmm. you know, he measures mm-hmm. for moisture and stuff. And we're just really on top of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and... And then the heavy metals, lead, there's not lead in the fuel, but some of my older older folks or people who are raised overseas, yep. they will sometimes have high levels of lead. And then, unfortunately, you know, there's places like Flint, Michigan, right? Like right. Th- that was in the news not that long ago. And it, that's actually not all that uncommon in the U.S. for the water supply to have Obtained lead it. in yep. it. Yep. And for the levels to be higher than, than is healthy. And even like one, I think one point part... One, whatever the unit is on lab million, core. Part per million. Part per billion, part per million. It's, I, it's I don't know a lot of times the they of measure stuff. Yeah, so many parts per million is a, a in term I've blood, heard. I don't yeah. know in blood. I, I, yeah, I'm actually thinking uh, actually in the water itself. They measure yeah. stuff in parts per and million. And I typically measure it in urine. Right. But I know that like in kiddos who mm. are exposed to lead in the pipes, even small amounts of mm. lead in their blood consistently significantly lower IQ levels. Right. Right. And this will have an impact for the that's rest my, of their lives. That's, that's what happened to me. Now I know. <laughs> It was lead. It was no, no. I just think it was just years of washing my no, hands with gasoline. gasoline. I was gonna say it was the lead <laughs> yeah. and the gasoline, and and the pencils that we used to, you know, shoot each other with and get lead in the arms. I mean, it was you know, I grew up as a boy on a farm, so we did lots of things that were not conducive, probably to good health. Who knew that you know all that stuff was bad for you? It was a lot of fun at the time. 
<laughs> that probably made up for it. It's like all the people in Italy, like drinking wine and yeah. eating all this gluten, yeah. but like they're together and they're having the best time ever. And so it's yeah. totally okay. Right. Offsets. Well, and actually we've had Dan Butner on the show and we've talked about the blue zone. So it's, uh, as you were saying some of the stuff earlier, I was relating to some of the stuff he said, just kind of about the exercise and the diet and cause they're, cause they're also doing olive oils and things with healthy fats in them. Right. It's not just all mm-hmm. bread they're, and they're yeah. doing, and they're doing low quantities of like wine that has, you know, that's grown right there. And they're, not drinking heavily it's a glass for lunch and a a, a glass is like six ounces or four ounces or something it's like when we think wine it's like a 12 ounce tumbler or something and then we refill it three times we're like this has got to be healthy for me right (laughs) i feel better All those polyphenols, all my, yes, all yes, my problems exactly. are gone. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't mean to get us off track. Um, Not at all. So stress management, and then uh, yeah, what was your, was it, did we cover all three? Toxins yeah. in the environment, mold, and... Um, and heavy metals. Heavy yeah, metals, and then, You know, right. kind of the, the direction we were going around stress mm-hmm. management, and really what I think is valuable about Marama, and even your, mm-hmm. your care facility, right, mm-hmm. is community. right. And this, this opportunity, especially with COVID, right, we see the, the detrimental effects yeah, of isolation, definitely. especially from a peer group. And um, how, yeah, just demoralizing, of course, the pre- depression, anxiety, yep. cognitive function. But we have even seen it when people need to be isolated at Marama. There's an increased fall risk. Mm. There's an increased risk of urinary tract infections. There's right. an increased risk of, of, um, of disorientation, of mm-hmm. sleep disturbances, right? So it's not just the the cognitive or right. excuse me like the mental health the depression anxiety of isolation it there's physical, the physical yeah things that happen right and so community having people to celebrate with having people to look forward to holidays with having having those those memories be made that shared experience is it, we are social creatures right and when we don't have that which a lot of uh, society is kind of set up for us to just be in front of our phones and pretty mm-hmm. isolated from mm-hmm. that, that interaction, regardless of your age, but especially as we age after retirement or, you know, nowadays with so many people not going into the office, it's very easy, easy for someone to just become very disconnected right. and that our brains do not thrive on that. Right. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. 110%. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I will, I will not share my examples, but yes. I, I, I have my own experiences that during and post COVID went from kind of an extrovert to an introvert, literally. Um, even though I was always, you know, liked, I needed space away from people at certain times. I went from like, l- I went to almost not wanting to go out at all to be in public spots. And it wasn't fear of getting COVID. It was just more of this, I don't know, just this withdrawal and this kind of introverted. And so it's taken a while to still not there to actually be like, oh yeah, I do want to go to that party or I do want to go out and do whatever. It's like, eh, I'll just stay at home with the fam. Yeah. The social anxiety yeah. of like, I don't remember how to hug. Right. <laughs> like, right. Like stepping on people's toes. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> Um, well, all good stuff. Well, Dr. Heather Sanderson, I love the work you're doing. Love, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We'd love to see more of you. Oh, Matt, I'd love to be there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. It's been such a pleasure being here with you today. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>